when in 1974 our special guest demonstrated to an American audience a graphical user interface in which the user could bring up on the screen the equivalent of an electronic calculator he was laughed at. Well, 20 years on, we all know who's laughing now. This and many other examples of far-seeing technological wisdom is a very good reason for listening attentively to our special guest, Professor Robert Spence. Welcome to Video Interface. Hi, Steve. You've recently concluded uh, some research on what we're going to be doing with computers in the year 2020. Would you like to set the scene and say how that was done? Yes. Um, in my own research, uh, I value visions. I think uh, you need visions to give you some guidance as to what you're d going to be doing. And I thought it would be a rather nice idea to interview about a dozen eminent engineers and ask them what their visions were uh, about how we'd be doing engineering design in the year 2020. I interviewed them, I distilled the visions, and I presented them in an envisionment video. Not a prediction, but an envisionment. Right. Yes. Well, we're grateful to you for bringing that video along. We'll be looking at some clips. Perhaps you'd like to give us some of the highlights of, uh, of some of these visions. Yeah. Um, in fact, it was very interesting. Um, they spent very little time discussing technology, mm -hmm. perhaps surprisingly. And the reason is summed up uh, in two quotations that I've got here. Mm -hmm. uh, one person said, the CPU constraints on anything that we can imagine are gone. So that puts the ball firmly in our court. It does. Uh, the other person said, bandwidth will become a commodity that is free and irrelevant. Distance is already irrelevant. Mm -hmm. OK. They then concentrated on the use of those technologies. Right. Yeah. So how are the ways that we are going to be using computers going to change? OK. L let me give you an example. One example is what you might call a transparent wall. Your Japanese and you're in Kyoto, I'm in London, and we both want to design part of a car. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a transparent wall between us um, where we could both design on that wall, you could rub out something I've done, and we could collaborate in that way very productively. Mm. And one of the advantages is, is that I can see your expression. Because you might not want to tell me that my idea is crazy, but the fact that your eyebrow goes up by half a <laughs> millimeter tells me all I need to know. Right. Yes. <laughs> We're already beginning to see this sort of thing on the PC screen in data sharing and so on. But um, the sort of thing that you're predicting, or not predicting, must mm. use the right word, envisioning, envisioning, envisioning yes. um, would uh, establish three dimensional views through the wall, surely, and, and so yes. forth. Yes, uh, three dimensional views just a, literally as if you were the other side of that glass wall. Right. Yes, that's so, uh, it's real as far as we're concerned. Might yes. it not be the case that um, the consultant uh, would actually cost more than the link to Kyoto? Uh, it would. Um, and I, I think the whole area of consultancy will, will change. Um, but if a human consultant is expensive, and they often are, then what you're going to see is people renting um, advisory software and accessing it through software characters. So in other words, if I don't know something about um, uh, toxicity, for example, I'm, I'm designing something medical, I want to know something about toxicity, I'll get some software on toxicity, plug it in my machine, I'll select, in my case, a rather beautiful lady that I can talk to on that screen, and I will ask questions and receive answers. And when she doesn't know the answer, she'll tell me, so that I can then perhaps approach my human consultant instead. Right. Yes. This is very much into the, into the area of artificial intelligence, and as well as expert systems, isn't it? Expert systems, I think, in that case, rather than artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Right. That's right. One thing that I noticed from, uh, from the video um, was the idea of what I might call total immersion in data. Um, right, yes. Explain to us a little bit about this concept as well. This is to do with the, what I would call the data revolution. Uh, everybody talks about the information revolution, but I think that hasn't come yet. We've got a huge amount of data, and we've got to get insight into it. Why don't we uh, present that data uh, typically graphically, 
um, on floor-to-ceiling displays, which will be around in the year 2020, not because I want them, but because consumers want them for entertainment. Mm -hmm. And look at that data and visualize it. In other words, build a mental model of that data so that I get better understanding of it. But it won't be just graphics. It'll be sound will convey data as well. Mm. I can listen to the stresses in a bridge um, because they're um, tied to the sound of a violin, perhaps. Uh, some other aspect of the bridge, its, uh, it, its uh, deflection might be coded by the bassoon player. Okay, So I can watch, I can interact, mm. and I can have this very immersive experience which will allow not just me, but my collaborators to get insight into that data. That requirement's rather tight. Hang on. I think there's a trade-off there. Wait a second. I can hear the stress level getting rather high in that component. So you're saying that we're going to be listening indeed to listening data. Listening to it. The question arises, how many of the five senses can we stimulate with computer data, do you think? I don't think we'll be smelling it. Uh, mm. I think we might be touching it. Right. Because there's a lot of things you can do with, with touch. Suppose you're designing a molecule and you've got a, I'm not an expert by the way, but I presume you'd take hold of another molecule and try and fit it in. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be nice if you could hear that squeezing in, clunk, and feel that molecule going in? So right. you're using sight, sound, and feel. And perhaps know whether it's a good match or yes. not quite so good Absolutely. match. Absolutely. It might rattle around, or, yes. Interesting, yeah. interesting. You, you mentioned um, users will demand these sort of large screens because of entertainment. Do you think entertainment and the home is really going to drive this process forward? Yes, it, it's going to be consumer-led. The, the only reason that engineering designers like me are going to have floor-to-ceiling displays is that uh, the consumers, and particularly maybe those in the Pacific Rim, they're going to fall in love with interactive movies and worldwide games, you know, the, the, the Olympiad involving computer games. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's going to lead the technological revolution. Mm. But what I'm concerned with as a, as a designer is how do I exploit that new technology? Mm. Yeah, it's going to be terrific. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're clearly, clearly an enthusiast for, yeah. the, for the future. One other point I'd like to bring out of mm. your video um, is the pigs. Mm. Um, the pigs. Let's, let's just stop for a moment and have a quick look at, look at some pigs. Sure. Right. You see these personal information gatherers that we all take for granted nowadays? What a quiet revolution in the way folks get along. I just wish somebody would come up with a more snappy name for them. Well, pig is the acronym. <laughs> Hardly <laughs> elegant. But just look at them all here, chattering away to one another. To one another. To one another. To one another. Hardly elegant. I like the name they have for them in the Pacific. <laughs> Curious. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, but um, haven't I met you before? Is that a pass? No, seriously. My uh, PIG guided me to a virtual meeting place on the Matrix, and I've seen you on a video talking about networks. I do remember. I chose to leave that video there while I was trawling the literature. Mm, it's remarkable. Came across a couple of journals still published on paper. <laughs> yeah, Sir William was reminiscing about uh, email and bulletin boards. Yeah. <laughs> How did you meet girls on the network in those days? <laughs> That's uh, an elegant PIG. This older thing picks up video and audio, of course. Mm -hmm. Let's me tag the interesting bits, trend to my voice and handwriting. Mm. Poor little thing. <laughs> Could you describe for us exactly what a pig does? A pig might be something like this. In fact, as far as you're concerned, this might be a, a pig, a personal information gatherer, or to be more precise, a personal data gatherer. But uh, PIG sounds a lot better. Mm. It would record sound, uh, what we're discussing right now, 
it would record vision, it would record image. And you might look at this little guy and think that I'm getting it in stereo because of the two eyes there. Mm. Um, okay, that would wander around with a person, uh, literally recording everything in both professional life and social life. Um, a huge amount of data, absolutely, but recorded maybe temporarily on some uh, memory that you wear and then maybe downloaded to some bigger memory at home or work. Um, the problem is accessing that data. You know, I met this guy three years ago. He was fairly tall. He had blue eyes and a, a very multicolored tie. And I think he said something about, OK, now, maybe by using those things I can recall, somehow you can dig out that data and replay it for me on, on a screen. Th there's a huge problem there, and I don't know how we're going to solve it. But that was one of the, I would say, visions that came out that might not be acceptable for social reasons. Because mm -hmm. if you and I had a dinner party, I don't think you'd like me recording everything. Mm. So I, that's the vision. I mean, these are visions being tossed out for you and I and everybody else to evaluate. And they, that one might never come to pass. Mm. Who knows? Yes, I can see that a whole new set of social conventions mm. and mores would, would build up around the fact that almost everything uh, that everybody yes. does and says <coughs> is right. liable to be video recorded, yes. basically. Yes. yes. This is a problem. I think when people interact with these new technologies uh, over a network in playing games, you know, I'd be playing some game with a guy in Los Angeles, protocols will develop, and we don't know much about them at the moment, but I think in this particular case, you know, people might draw the line and say, if you're wearing one of these and have it switched on, I'm going to be very circumspect mm. about what I say. Mm. That could be difficult. It occurs to me as we speak, are we in danger of becoming very insular? If we're going to meet across transparent walls right. and, and so forth, are we ever going to travel in the future? Yes, yes. The, the, uh, the visionaries I talked to said, we're still going to be traveling because there's that person-to-person, -person, the value in that person-to-person -person interaction that's very difficult to define, but we're going to want to keep it. So none of them envisaged uh, us all just sitting in our little tally cottages or whatever, um, looking at the outside world only on a screen. Mm. No, we're still going to be traveling because it's fun as well. Right. Yeah. So it's a, it's a bright looking technological future oh, from yeah. your standpoint. Yeah. Oh, it's very bright. Yes. And you're yeah. obviously looking forward, enjoyable. forward to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, I must I say, want to try and influence it as well. I'm sure you will be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will be. I must say I'm looking forward to it as well. Professor Spence, I've been sitting here fascinated. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very us. much. Indeed. Thank you.